on World News Tonight. Deadly heat wave. Hundreds across Europe now literally on fire with climate change and the UK set to hit its hottest temperature ever. Tory race. UK leadership contenders fight to prove why they should be the next Prime Minister in the latest debate. President pressured. New backlash on Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia as Americans in question of the rising gas prices. And it's the cycling parade. Thousands of Muscoviets attend a summer cycling bicycle parade welcoming the lifting of COVID restrictions. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we are starting off with a deadly heat wave sweeping across Europe. Wildfires are blazing throughout Europe and parts of northern Africa. In countries such as Spain and France, thousands are fleeing from their homes as fires intensify. In the United Kingdom, government officials held an emergency meeting because of the deadly heat wave. Authorities across southern Europe continue to battle huge wildfires on Sunday in countries including Spain, Greece, France and Italy, with hundreds of deaths blamed on soaring temperatures that scientists say are consistent with climate change. Shocked residents watched thick plumes of smoke rise above Spain's central western Herte Valley. Resident Miguel Angel Tomeo said the heat was making their previously green and cool home more like Spain's semi-arid south. Across the country in Catalonia, people were forced to flee their homes as wildfires quickly spread near residential areas. Temperatures in the country have reached as high as 114 degrees Fahrenheit or 45.7 Celsius during the nearly week-long heat wave. Residents in Madrid took to the streets in an annual water fight to battle the heat. Spain's weather agency said it would end Monday but warned temperatures would remain abnormally high. In France, wildfires have now spread over 27,000 acres in the southwestern region of Gironde, and more than 14,000 people have been evacuated, regional authorities said Sunday, adding that more than 1,200 firefighters were working to control blazes that have grown massively over the past few days. The country has issued red alerts for several regions, the highest possible warning, urging residents to be extremely vigilant. In Italy, where smaller fires have blazed in recent days, forecasters expect temperatures above 40 Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit in several regions in coming days. Similar temperatures are forecast in Britain on Monday and Tuesday in what would top a previous official record of 38.7 Celsius or 102 Fahrenheit set in Cambridge in 2019. Britain's National Weather Service has issued its first extreme heat warning for parts of England. On Sunday, the beaches in the southern town of Bournemouth were packed as people sought to cool off in the sea. Now, as Europe is struggling with extreme heat, China is drowning, on the other hand, with flash floods as it has caused thousands to evacuate. Extreme weather events are more likely to occur in the near future as well due to the extreme climate change. Flash floods in southwest and northwest China have left at least a dozen dead and put thousands of others in harm's way, state media reported on Sunday. In the southwestern province of Sichuan, at least six people have died and another 12 are missing after torrential rain triggered flash floods, it reported. Some 1,300 people had been evacuated as of Saturday, the report said. Meanwhile, in Longnan City, in the northwestern province of Gansu, another six deaths were reported. 3,000 people have been evacuated. Experts say extreme weather events are becoming more likely because of climate change. Warmer air can store more water, leading to bigger cloudbursts when it's released. The flooding adds to China's economic problems that have been brought on partly by stringent zero COVID measures that have restricted travel and disrupted supply chains. In the United Kingdom now, the race for Britain's next Prime Minister is heating up. Five candidates remain and they laid out their plans in a long television debate, clashing over tax cuts, Brexit, trans rights and public trust. To give us the current situation, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Bilini Senviratna from London in the United Kingdom. Bilini. Yes, Shanali. 
Former Finance Minister Rishi Sunak, who has emerged as the favourite among the 358 Conservative lawmakers, said there would be a cost to cut in taxes which could risk Britons incurring high inflation and increased mortgage rates. Another frontrunner, current Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, responded by arguing that Britain is headed towards a recession because of Sunak's tax increases during his time as Finance Minister. When asked if they would be happy to have Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who said he would step down as leader on July 7th, serve in their cabinet, all of the candidates failed to raise their hands. Whoever gets the job will take on rocketing inflation and low economic growth, as well as the public lack of confidence in politics after Johnson's scandal-ridden time in power. Opinion polls also suggest the Conservatives are falling significantly behind the opposition Labour Party. Although a Sunday Telegraph poll showed Sunak ahead, the race remains wide open as Truss has broad support including from most loyal to Boris Johnson, while Junior Minister Penny Mordaunt has topped surveys of the 200,000 party members who will ultimately choose who becomes Conservative leader and therefore Prime Minister. One candidate will be knocked out every day in the next three days, leaving a final two to face the verdict of Conservative Party members. They will vote for the winner, who will be announced on September 5th. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you, Dilini. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Dilini Senvi Ratna, reporting from London in the United Kingdom. President Joe Biden was heading home after his visit from the Middle East. The trip was steeped in controversy before he even left Washington, D.C. But the controversy has only grown bigger and more complicated. First the fist bump, now the fallout. President Biden en route home to the U.S. after his most consequential and controversial foreign visit since taking office. <laughs> Today, meeting with nine Arab leaders, reiterating how interwoven America's interests remain to successes in the Middle East. We will not walk away and leave a vacuum to be filled by China, Russia, or Iran. And again to a room full of autocrats and monarchs emphasizing the value of human rights and the freedom of dissent. I've gotten plenty of criticism over the years. It's not fun. But the ability to speak openly and exchange ideas freely is what unlocks innovation. Still, the president is facing fierce bipartisan criticism for treating Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman not as a pariah, but as a partner. Despite saying he rebuked MBS for the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi that U.S. intelligence says the Crown Prince ordered. The Saudi foreign minister tonight disputing President Biden's insistence that during their meeting he challenged MBS's claim he was not responsible for Khashoggi's brutal killing. The president mentioned that this was an issue. Uh, he mentioned that he took Saudi Arabia's assurances at face value. The White House tonight insists the visit here was worth it. How can you advance human rights if you're not willing to actually get on a plane and go somewhere and talk to foreign leaders about your concerns? The president returns home touting a Saudi commitment to pump more oil to relieve high gas prices in the U.S. But it remains unclear when Americans will see that relief with OPEC not set to meet again until next month. Still in the United States, the January 6th committee has now issued a subpoena to the Secret Service looking for erased or secret text messages on the day of the riot. Those missing texts are key evidence that the committee says are a crucial piece of the puzzle. Overnight, the January 6th committee issued its first public subpoena to an executive branch agency, requesting the U.S. Secret Service turn over its text messages from January 5th and 6th, ones an internal watchdog says disappeared. We have a right to obtain all relevant information. We're not going to stop until we get everything. In a letter to Congress, the inspector general wrote that the messages were erased after his office requested records of electronic communications. The Secret Service said some were wiped out during a planned cell phone migration, but insisted none of the texts requested by the Inspector General were lost. Those texts could be key in understanding the events surrounding the attack on the Capitol and help corroborate Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. 
A Washington, D.C. police officer backed up this account of the former president's actions that day, according to an official connected with the January 6th committee. The Secret Service has until Tuesday to respond. Meanwhile, the committee is pushing ahead in its investigation, zeroing in on one potential witness in particular. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now turning to the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky sacked his chief prosecutor and the head of the country's security agency in the largest government shakeup since the start of the Russian invasion nearly five months ago. The move came as the Ukrainian military official warned that Russia is preparing for the next stage of its offensive in Ukraine. President Vladimir Zelensky's nightly address to the nation is normally an opportunity to rally Ukrainian resistance in the face of Russia's war. But Sunday night's edition took a different tone. Today, I made the decision to dismiss the prosecutor general and remove the head of the security service of Ukraine. In the video posted on Telegram, Zelensky didn't mention the dismissed officials by name, and he didn't need to. The firings of Prosecutor General Irina Venediktova and the head of the Ukrainian security service Ivan Bakunov are being described as the biggest political sacking since the start of the war. The president says he let the officials go after revelations that more than 60 members in their agencies had been working against Ukraine in Russian-occupied territories, and they aren't the only ones. 651 criminal proceedings have been registered regarding state treason and collaborative activities of employees of prosecutors' offices, pre-trial investigation institutions and other law enforcement agencies. The dismissals come as the investigation of tens of thousands of war crimes which Russia has been accused of committing in Ukraine remains underway. Irina Venediktova has played a key role in the probe. The president has wasted no time in filling her vacant post. He's assigned Oletsky Sinomenko as the new prosecutor general. Zelensky is yet to name a replacement for Ivan Bakunov, the former head of the Ukrainian security service. In New York, the epicenter of the U.S. monkeypox outbreak, a long line of men aged 20 to 40 wait for a vaccine to protect themselves and their loved ones against the virus. It may look like a COVID-19 vaccination center, but this site in New York is being used to fight a different virus, monkeypox. Outside, long queues of men wait to get vaccinated against the disease. While anyone can catch monkeypox, doses in the U.S. are currently reserved for men who have sex with men. They make up the vast majority of cases. People say more needs to be done to spread the word about the vaccination drive among the LGBTQ community. The virus, whose symptoms include a rash, fever, aches and chills, spreads through close physical contact. The number of infections in New York continues to rise. More than 680 cases have been recorded in the city since the U.S. outbreak began in May. As cases climb, demand for vaccines soars. It's a similar story across the country. U.S. officials are warning that there aren't enough doses to meet demand. New York is already feeling the squeeze. The only approved doses against monkeypox available in the U.S. is the Geneos vaccine by Bavarian Nordic. Over 150,000 of its doses have been distributed nationwide. A shipment of 786,000 shots was stuck in Denmark while it awaited review from U.S. authorities. It's now received the green light and is on its way. A Ukrainian cargo plane carrying munitions from Serbia to Bangladesh clashed near the city of Kavala in northern Greece, killing all the crew members. Explosive experts, armed forces, firefighters and Red Cross volunteers all called to the site of a plane crash after a Ukrainian-operated cargo aircraft went down near Kavala in northern Greece. Local residents reported seeing a fireball and hearing explosions for two hours after it went down. It was full of smoke. It had a noise I can't describe and went over the mountain. It passed the mountain and turned and crashed into the field. There were flames. We were scared. A lot of cars came, but they could not approach because there were continuous explosions. 
According to Greek authorities, the flight was heading from Serbia to Bangladesh. The pilot, reporting a problem with one of the plane's engines, requested an emergency landing in Kavala, but crashed some 40 kilometers from the airport, killing all eight crew members. According to Serbian authorities, the cargo plane was carrying mines and around 11 tons of weapons to Bangladesh when it crashed on Saturday night. The plane took off from Nice yesterday around 8.40 p.m. local time and was carrying 11.5 tonnes of products of our arms trade for the end buyer in Bangladesh. The buyer was the Bangladesh Ministry of Defence as a fully permitted end user, end buyer. Experts are now investigating whether any dangerous chemicals were released in the crash and what caused this tragic incident. Now, between South Korea and Japan is the East Sea at its narrowest, separating the mainland of the two countries by less than 200 kilometers. That means if Japan has an earthquake, Korea would be hit by a tsunami. It has happened before. So South Korea has set up its first tsunami floodgate, a barrier that will protect against waves almost four meters high. Standing at the entrance of Samtuk Port in Gangwon Province is South Korea's first tsunami prevention safety tower. It took seven years to complete and cost roughly 38.6 million U.S. dollars. The structure has two 15-story towers and when put into operation, a huge floodgate slowly descends between the towers. When a tsunami warning is issued, this iron floodgate that's 50 meters long and 7 meters high blocks the entrance to the port. Additionally, a 900-meter-long barrier gate around the floodgate closes to protect the fishing boats at the port as well as the coastal village. The floodgate is designed to prevent flooding from tsunami waves up to 3.7 meters high. We are expecting this to help protect lives, property and livelihoods by minimizing damage to fishing boats, coastal restaurants and houses around the port. If a magnitude 7 earthquake hits the west coast of Japan, this could cause a tsunami to cross the East Sea and hit Korea 90 minutes later. The East Sea is at high risk of earthquake tsunamis because its depth is over 1,000 meters, and there is a high chance of being hit with a magnitude 7 earthquake. In the area of Samtok, where the floodgate has been set up, there have been major tsunamis in 1983 and 1993, which caused five deaths and over 540,000 U.S. dollars in property damage. This flood prevention tower has also become a landmark. The top floor has an observatory open to the public free of charge, where it also hopes to provide earthquake and tsunami-related education programs. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Hungarians demonstrated against Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government in the latest of a series of demonstrations since his right-wing Fidesz party passed legislation sharply raising taxes on small firms. 17 years after calling off their first engagement, actor Ben Affleck and singer Jennifer Lopez appear to have finally tied the knot. The couple got married in Las Vegas after restarting their relationship nearly two decades after they separated. In South Korea, more people will be able to receive their second COVID-19 booster. Previously, only people aged 60 and above and those with weak immune systems were eligible. Elon Musk said that in a filing that Twitter is trying to unfairly speed through a trial over his plan to cancel his $44 billion deal to buy the social media network. Competing for the title of Fisher King, competitors in Germany tried to knock each other into a lake in a traditional water jousting competition. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed watching any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight, let's take a look at the thousands of cyclists taking part in a summer bicycle parade in the Russian capital in celebration of the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. Stay safe and have a good night.